So something that is carried on a body chromosome and you have to inherit two copies to be affected, if we're talking about a disease, would be a what? Autosomal recessive condition. So we're going to talk about some autosomal recessive conditions. Now, <clears throat> if it's an autosomal recessive condition, it affects males and females identically. Anybody can get this. And you remember what the example that I mentioned on Friday was? Disease that tends to, people used to just die as small children. Now they can live pretty long lives. Cystic fibrosis. So it is a disease where the body mismanufactures one particular protein. It is a single gene change. And if you get sort of the, the bummer allele, if you get the recessive allele for that, no big deal. If you get two of that recessive allele, you have the disease. And um, <clears throat> people with CF produce very thick mucus, which coats the insides of their lungs, coats the inside of their entire digestive tract. They have a hard time as, as babies. Um, I told you the woman I went to school with, um, they don't gain weight because they can't absorb nutrients through the intestines. Um, they're prone to lung infections. Because if, if anybody here has ever had bronchitis, or something else where you have those like lungs full of snot, that's kind of life for a CF patient, is lungs full of mucus all the time. Not a nice thing. <clears throat> and with autosomal recessive conditions, we can generically use the alleles big N and little n. Where big N is not affected, okay, and you're going to do this right on the sample space. You're going to follow along. <clears throat> so big N is unaffected. Little n is affected. Okay? Okay, so let's say we have two. So that, that term was carrier, and I'm just going to write that up here. Carrier has one copy of recessive allele. So with autosomal recessive conditions, we do worry a little bit about our carriers, because if they meet another carrier and reproduce with another carrier, there's some risk to their offspring. So let's say we have two carriers who have children. We would put mom's genotype up here, and what would a carrier's genotype be? Big N, little n, because she's going to have one copy of the recessive. And if dad is also a carrier, what's the, the father's genotype? Same thing, big N, little n. So go ahead and complete the Punnett square. Homozygous recessive. For any, for any recessive condition, there are three possible genotypes. Homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive. Now, if we look at our offspring from this particular pairing, how many homozygous dominant do we have? Just hold up fingers. One. We have one homozygous dominant offspring. How many heterozygous offspring do we have? Two. Oops. We have two heterozygous offspring. And those are these ones. Those are the carriers in the next generation. How many homozygous recessive offspring do we have? One. And that's the one we've got to worry about. If this is CF, that's the baby who's born who isn't gaining weight well, um, who may be suffering from frequent lung infections. And they typically, those kids now, because of the kind of genetic testing we have available to pregnant women, those kids are diagnosed prior to birth. So a family knows when this baby is born, they are going to need some immediate medical interventions. They're going to need some drug therapy from pretty much day one, and they, they know what to do. Unlike the woman I went to high school with, who her parents didn't know what was wrong, and she could have died before they got a diagnosis. She was a couple weeks old when they got a diagnosis. Um, and hers, I think her case is pretty severe. Um, there are people who have less severe cases of CF, apparently. There are some different variants of the disease, um, and there are some kids, there's a video that we may or may not get to see later 
um, with a little boy who isn't diagnosed till like six or seven months. And he was still gaining weight, not as fast as they expected, um, but he had had these lung infections. He had had this cough his whole life, and it, it took him a little bit longer to diagnose because he wasn't so severe. So, okay, that's an autosomal recessive condition. Great. These, remember, are Mendelian traits. Simple, dominant recessive, just carried on autosomal chromosomes. Now, everybody asks, and I, we didn't do this one yet. We're going to move away from the autosomes, and we're going to move to the sex chromosomes. So first, I want to just do a cross with sex chromosomes, just looking at, oh, wait, and we didn't, I'm sorry, we didn't finish this. We didn't do the phenotype. For an autosomal, for, for any phenotype with a Mendelian trait, we generally have, what, two phenotypes. For this one, what would they be? Affected, unaffected. Notice I have a little asterisk by um, affected. How many of our offspring are unaffected? If you look up at your genotypes, are homozygous dominant offspring affected? No. Are heterozygous offspring affected? No. So we have three who are unaffected. One out of those offspring is going to be affected. Now, does this mean that if a couple who were carriers had four babies, one would be affected, two would be carriers, and one would be homozygous? No. They can have four kids in a row who were affected. Um, my friend's family, her older sister was born, had no health issues whatsoever. Um, second baby was born, clearly something was wrong. They got the diagnosis of CF. They ended up adopting two more children because they wanted to have a big family. And after they knew that they were both carriers for CF, and they were, I mean, they were kind of, had their hands full taking care of their second child who was very, very sick when she was young. They decided they just couldn't risk having a second baby with CF. Um, so they decided to adopt, and they, they ended up adopting two little boys, and they have a wonderful family of four. For people who know they are both carriers, those are the kind of choices they face. Um, now, what's interesting, a few years ago, my friend actually came and talked to my biology class about CF and about life with CF and sort of the genetic um, ramifications of it. Of these three who are unaffected, are any of them carrying that gene? Yes. So when we talk about autosomal recessive conditions, we also talk about carriers. And we would expect, one to two to one, roughly half of their offspring would be carriers. And so my friend's older sister, who was in my class, um, she's married, she has two kids, she had to get tested when she got pregnant, and it turns out she is in fact a carrier. Now she got lucky, Her the man she met and fell in love with randomly, and you do not genetically screen people when you are meeting them and falling them in love with them. Here, oh you're really interesting, I'd like to go on a second date with you, Can get you give me a tube of blood please, I just need to run some lab work, it'll be fine. You don't do that, that's not part of the courtship process. Um, luckily, the man she ended up marrying and having children with is not a carrier. So there is no risk that they're going to have a child with CF. However, when her kids are older, and her kids I think are in middle school, um, when her kids are older and they're interested in reproducing, they will have to be tested for carrier status. And she has one boy, one girl. So they, they could be carriers. We don't know yet. They might have dodged the bullet. They might both be homozygous dominant. Okay. Let's look, let's get off of the autosomal chromosomes. Let's talk about sex chromosomes. Okay, so you flip the page, you're on that first square, and the trait here is sex. This is biological sex. Biological sex is chromosomal makeup. Um, we're going to only deal with the most common configurations. What are the possible alleles for the sex chromosomes? The one case where it's not uppercase and lowercase. X and Y. 
Yeah, so the possible alleles are X and Y. And unless, there are cases where people have XXX or XXY or XO, but we're only going to deal with the common configurations. Um, they're the easiest to deal with. So in general, when people are reproducing, you have to have an XX and an XY in order to reproduce. Okay. So mom's information would go across the top. Mom is XX. Dad's information would go down the side. What's dad going to be? XY. And very often in cases where people are either XO or XXY or XXX, um, in as far as I know, and I could completely be proven wrong on this, there may be further research, many of those folks are not fertile. They are not able to reproduce on their own, so if they want to have a family, they have to look at things like adoption or other options. Okay, same thing that you do with any other Punnett square. XX, XX, XY, XY. Now, in this case, how many possible genotypes are there? Fingers. Two. We don't have three possible genotypes here because we don't have uppercase and lowercase letters. So the possible genotypes are XX and XY. And how many XX offspring do we see? Two. How many XY offspring do we see? Two. The ratio here is one to one. And we talked a little bit about this last week. What that means is that roughly half, if, if all other things were equal, roughly half of all babies conceived would be male, roughly half of all fertilized eggs would be female. Um, it's actually not quite half and half. Um, I believe, as I recall, more babies are, more baby boys are, more fertilized eggs start off as XY, um, though more of those are subsequently lost. So... Phenotypes, and for this, we class them in two phenotypes, male and female. I should actually make that female than male, since that's the way they're listed up there. And it's two to two, so again, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. It's pretty easy. Now, just as we've been talking about with all of these, does that mean if you have two children, one will be a boy, one will be a girl? No. If you have four babies, will two of them be girls and two of them be boys? No. If you have 16 babies, you're crazy. Um, will eight of them be boys and eight of them be girls? No. My cousin Jimmy Adcock has six beautiful, wonderful, delightful girls. All in a row. <laughs> Including a set of identical twins. All girls. It's, it's an interesting household. So, we can run the ratios. It doesn't mean that you're going to get one-to-one. -one, okay? But that's the, the rough, um, that's the rough ratio we expect to see in a large population. Now, what we're going to talk about is what's called a sex-linked disorder. So we talked about autosomal recessives, and now we're going to talk about something that is a sex-linked disorder. Because now we know how to run a Punnett square using our X and Y chromosomes. And if you remember, when we looked initially at that karyotype, and there's our karyotype, we said that there are genes on all of these chromosomes. There are genes on all the autosomes, and that's the first 22 pairs. But there are also genes on those chromosomes, on the sex chromosomes. Um, for instance, there is a gene on the X chromosome that tells your eye how to build the rods and the cones in your eye that allow you to see things. And it especially tells your body how to build the cones, which are the cells that allow you to see color. So, we've got these genes on the X and Y chromosome that tell your body how to do some stuff, how to make particular proteins. If there was something that was carried on the X chromosome, 
that was a disease or a condition, would it affect males more often or females more often? So roughly half of you are saying it will affect females more often. Roughly half of you are saying it will affect males more often. And I have one table that says it will affect everybody equally. So what is it? So if, it's gonna, if you think it's going to affect females more often, why? Why? Okay, they have two X's, so if there's something bad on an X chromosome, then females have two X chromosomes. Duh, double the chances. Okay. If you think it's going to affect males more frequently, why? They only have that one. X. They only have one. Okay. So then wouldn't it affect them half as much? Why not? You don't know, but you're convinced because they only have one. Okay. Who here already drives a car? Who, who drives? Some of you drive. Okay. Most of you just ride in cars so far. That's fine. Anybody got a spare tire in the trunk? Your tire goes flat. You have an extra tire to put on it. No fun to change a tire on the side of the road, but you should be prepared. Well, gentlemen, I hate to tell you this. When it comes to sex chromosomes, you have no spare. You're running down the road with no spare tire. You blow something up, that's it. You're stuck. Because the fact that you don't have a second copy of an X chromosome means that if there is some bad gene on the X and you get it, there's no good copy to fall back on for instructions. So things that are carried on the X and Y chromosome are called sex-linked. But the most common sex-linked disorders we see are actually X-linked. If you look at the picture, there are very few genes on a Y chromosome. It's really pretty shrimpy. So there aren't a whole lot of genes on a Y chromosome. But there are a significant number of genes on the X chromosome, including the ones, and we're going to talk about colorblindness. Um, this is a favorite of mine. My husband is colorblind. Okay. This does not mean he sees in black and white. Um, I, won't, I won't do the put you on the spot and ask if there's anybody in here who's colorblind. Um, you can have a colorblind female. It's very unusual. Um, my husband is colorblind. He can't distinguish between shades of different colors. Um, when we were dating, we were on our way to some kind of family gathering with his family, and he, I got to his house, and he walked downstairs, and he said, I was feeling really monochromatic today. And I said, does that mean that you think that's all the same color? He was wearing like three different shades of blue. Like really different. Like navy and something that you could almost call, I don't know, like a brighter blue. They were really different. I sent him upstairs to go change. <laughs> Just go pick something else. That's not, that doesn't work. He cannot distinguish shades of blue. Royal blue and navy blue look the same to him. Now, um, the most common form of colorblindness in males is what's called red-green colorblindness. Um, males with red-green colorblindness can't distinguish red and green when they're on top of one another. My husband can look at a chair or a cap and say, oh yeah, that's green. He's, he's learned throughout his life people point to this color and it's green. Um, but if you lay certain shades of red on top of a certain shade of green, he can't see it. There's no contrast. Um, Mr. Interestingly enough, Mr. Voorhees, who many of you may have also had, um, is colorblind, and he's an identical twin. So they're both colorblind. And he has a really funny story about how they figured out they were colorblind. Um, has he told you guys this? The red and black rope laying in the grass. And neither he nor his twin could see it. It was completely invisible until their dad picked it up. They could see it clear as day against the blue sky. So that's colorblindness. Now, colorblindness is X-linked, and the way we show an X-linked recessive trait, it is an X-linked recessive, that's important. If it was a dominant disorder, women would be affected more, but X-linked recessives tend to affect males preferentially. Um, we show them with the X chromosome with an additional little letter up there. 
And the x itself is not uppercase or lowercase. The little letter at the top is. We have x big n, x little n. Why don't we show anything with a y chromosome here? These genes don't exist on the y chromosome. They only exist on the x chromosome. The x and y chromosome have different genes. Just like chromosome 1 and chromosome 13 have different genes, the x and the y have different genes. So if we're going to look, and we'll, we'll use colorblindness for this. It's an easy one. And it's, it's one that, you know, doesn't, doesn't negatively impact your life. You won't die of colorblindness, but you cannot be a pilot if you are colorblind. There are some careers that are out of reach for you. Okay, so let's say we have a mother who is a carrier for colorblindness. What would her genotype be? So the possible alleles here are X big N, X little n, and the trait is colorblindness. For a carrier mother, what would her genotype be? It would be X big N. Go ahead, you had it right. X little n. Should be X big N, X little n. If we have an unaffected father, he is not colorblind. What's his genotype? It's XY, but his X specifically is X big N. So he is X big N Y. So go ahead and complete the Punnett square, pull down your alleles. So for this, we actually have four possible genotypes. We have X big N, X big N. That's a female, and she is not a carrier. We have one. We have X, X big N, X little n, and that's a female who is a carrier. That's one. We have X big N, Y, male or female? Male. Is he a carrier? Is he affected? Is there anything up with him? No. He is not a carrier. He can't be a carrier, and he's unaffected. And then we have X little n, Y. That is my husband. That is a colorblind male right there. With, with X-linked disorders, we tend to split our ratios into ratios for females and ratios for males because the genotypes that are, or the phenotypes that are possible are different. So I'm going to just sort of do a little dividing line here. For females, well, we would have, um, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Half of them are not carriers. They're unaffected. They don't carry a gene for this. Half of them you would expect to be carriers. For males, males can't be carriers for X-linked disorders because they don't have two copies of an X chromosome. So they cannot be a carrier. For males, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, but that ratio is affected individuals and non-affected. Now what's interesting is my husband has one brother and um, within a month of dating him, I did a Punnett square for him. Because I'm like, no, really? Now, is your brother colorblind too? Because biologists get all excited when they meet people with any kind of you know, interesting and easily traceable um, genetic condition. Um, I did a Punnett square for his mom the first time I met her too. So, <laughs> crazy. Um, his brother is not affected. So they perfectly match the odds. They had two boys. One is colorblind. One is not colorblind. Could they, have could they have had two colorblind boys? Sure. Or they could have had two boys who weren't colorblind and the gene would die out. But as it turns out, they had one colorblind son, one, co one son with full color vision. Okay. The phenotypes. Again, phenotypes are what? Full color and colorblind. What did I just write? Okay, so for their female offspring, how many of their female offspring have full color vision? Two. 
but I'm going to put that little asterisk there because one of them is actually a carrier. She doesn't know it. My mother-in-law didn't know it until she had a kid who was colorblind, but one of those unaffected full color vision females is actually a carrier. Now, could we have a colorblind female? Yeah, but it would be crazy unusual. You would have to have a colorblind male meet and reproduce with a female who was a carrier. It can happen, but it's pretty uncommon. Now for the males, how many of these male offspring are full color vision? One. Could a male be a carrier? Nope. He only has one X. He's got no backup. If he has the X with the defect, he's affected. He cannot be a carrier. How many of the male offspring are affected? One. So the ratio for males of color vision to not color vision is one to one. And we generally say um, for the females that, you know, we say full color vision not carrier is one, carrier is one. So it's also one to one, but it's the difference between being a carrier or not. Okay, I'm going to have you do one on your own. So here's a puzzle for you. We're going to stick with color blindness. It's easy. It's fun. If you guys are up for it, we'll do a color blindness test and see if we have anybody in the class who is color blind. Um, and I haven't asked anybody if they're color blind yet or not, so I don't know. And yes, I am looking at the guys because it would most we would be it would be shockingly rare if we had a color blind female. So, okay, let's say we're still talking about color blindness. But now we have a guy who is colorblind who reproduces with a woman who's not a carrier. So here's mom, no genes for colorblindness, and here's dad. What are their offspring genotypes and and phenotypes and ratios. And remember, you have to split the male and female offspring. Go ahead. Okay, so we have all of the daughters are carriers. None of the sons are affected. Sons can't be carriers. Um, so for our genotype ratios, the big thing to know is that um, for, male, for colorblind males, um, they will pass on that sort of defective X to any of their female offspring. Um, for phenotype, we would have carrier, non-carrier for the females. Well, I guess we should say not carrier first. And that's a zero. Carrier is a two. What did I write there? I missed an R. For the males, we would have colorblind or not. And that's 0 to 2. So the genotype and phenotype ratios here are the same, 0 to 2 and 2 to 0. OK. We get a little bit of extra time to play with. Do you want to do a color blindness test, Ishimara test? Um, we will have, so tomorrow, there will be a brief recall quiz on colorblind inherit, or on sex-linked, X-linked inheritance when we walk in tomorrow. Then we'll start talking about the dye hybrids, because that's the next thing we need to cover.